Welcome to Behavioral Health Today, a podcast brought to you by the Triad Network. This podcast is designed to share trending topics occurring within the world and our communities and bring them a behavioral and mental health perspective. Welcome to Behavioral Health Today. I'm your host, Dr. Graham Taylor. My guest today is Linda Rosenberg. Linda has her master's degree in social work and is on the faculty of Columbia University's Department of Psychiatry as Director of External Relations, where she focuses on public and private sector partnerships that elevate, expand, and refine mental health and addictions care. Prior to joining Columbia, Linda was President and CEO of the National Council for Behavioral Health from 2004 until 2019. Under her leadership, the National Council became the nation's largest mental health and addiction education and advocacy association. With over 3,300 plus membership organizations serving over 10 million Americans. Linda was New York State's Senior Deputy Commissioner for Mental Health until 2004, and during her tenure, she opened New York's first mental health court. In addition to serving on Columbia's faculty, Linda consults with nonprofits, foundations, and private sector companies on the design and delivery of mental health and addiction services. We're so excited to have Linda with us today as we discuss the challenges of access to services and the effectiveness of current treatments being provided. Linda, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. I'm delighted to be here, and it's wonderful to meet you. Thank you so much. That's my pleasure. You know, we're going to get into the challenges of accessing mental health services and the effectiveness of the services currently being offered through the various organizations and practitioners out there doing some really good work. But first of all, you know, I, I'm so impressed with the depth and the breadth of your work in so many influential levels. You've had exposure to so many things related to mental health in our communities and in our nation. And given your unique history in the field, can you start us off today with sharing with us your understanding of some of the root causes underlying the mental health needs that we're seeing being evidenced today in our nation and in our communities? You know, I, I think everyone is struggling uh, to answer that question, particularly when it comes to adolescence, where we're really seeing a crisis with increased rates of anxiety, depression, and more adolescents showing up in our ERs, in our emergency rooms. I think parents are very tuned into it. And I think a lot of people speculate, certainly, that the pandemic and the isolation that came with the pandemic but perhaps more importantly, you know, the whole world of social media. I'm not an expert in that area, but I certainly have grandchildren, young granddaughter, actually, and I see the impact on her. You know, seeing yourself and then seeing everyone else having this idealized life that's often shown in social media on Instagram and TikTok. But, but I do think that all of that is having an impact. The other thing is, it is in some ways good news. So we are certainly talking about mental health. It's front and center mm -hmm. on everyone's conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the good news, right? For many, many years, we didn't talk about it at all. And in fact, you know, I remember when I was a little girl, when they used to whisper about cancer. And yeah. then as I was coming up, nobody really said, you know, I'm so depressed. I have to go see a therapist. It just wasn't shared. About 15 years ago, I realized coming home from D.C. every weekend to New York, where my husband was, and I was too old to get a new one, I would buy People magazine as a treat, really, for myself. And every issue had a celebrity in recovery, either from a mental illness or from an addiction. And I yeah. think that was the beginning of people being much more open. I think then the passage of parity in 2008, and then in 2012, the Affordable Care Act, telling insurance companies that they had to treat mental illness and addictions as they did physical disorders. I think all of those things have contributed to this tremendous openness. And I think that's been very good. It's been good for practitioners, right? I mean, just in the last legislative session in Congress, Medicare is now going to pay for marriage and family therapists, mental health counselors. That's a huge win because once CMS says Medicare will pay for it, the other insurance That's companies right. follow suit. So That's you have right. more opportunity for practitioners and you certainly have more demand from the public. So I think that's the environment, tremendous interest, lots of discussion. And then the question is, can we get care for the people that now want it? 
and what they get, is it effective? Yeah. You know, it's interesting what you're saying. The, the, the irony in this is that it's taken these crises to bring attention to and allow us to remove the stigma and the stereotypes and even being able just to utter and talk about, hey, of course we get depressed. Of course there's anxiety. Of course there's, you know, these things that naturally come up. We, you know, and, and we talk about, you know, our physical health and investing in that. We talk about our financial health and doing that. And, and now we get to talk as freely as you're saying about our mental health. And I think that conversation is one that we can kind of normalize and and oh, and, and validate. Absolutely. And I think we get to universalize it, that everybody goes through something. And yep. I just had a chance to talk with uh, Arthur, Dr. Arthur Evans, the oh, sure. uh, Good president friend, of the, of the, by the way. Are you, what a super yeah. guy. He's phenomenal. Oh, what a wonderful you know, guy. We had a, I ahead. met him originally when he was the head of behavioral health in Philadelphia yeah. and really uh, managed to create a system because we really don't have a system of mental health. But right. he was able to weave together the pieces there from prevention to treatment. And he's yeah. doing the same thing on a national level. He's very special. Well, he is special. And as I was you know, prepping for our show today and reading about you, and I could see very easily how much fun you guys would have in talking about the different things you've done, because there's really a creative energy that comes into what he's done and what you've done. And, and we're talking about how you know, at his primary, secondary, and tertiary, you know, kind of pyramid, you know, prevention model that he's using during his tenure and his position currently with APA, it fits with this idea that now we can start talking about these things and how wonderful it is that we can enter into various levels of prevention, not having to wait till someone, you know, has the cancer diagnosis, but what can you do in your diet or what can you do in your exercise day to day? What can you do in your mental health rather than waiting until you're depressed yeah. and needing medication or therapy? What can you do early on that can not just prevent, you know, depression and anxiety and all the other illnesses that we can have in terms of mental health, but how can you enhance your life? That's it. That's, how can you, how can so you take it to a- That is the good news. It's also confusing, I think, to the public. You know, more about that. brain is like the last frontier. So I, I try very hard not to say, you know, people neglected it, you know, physical health care didn't care. I think it's more, you know, we were able to standardize cardiac treatment. We we're able yeah. to fight various kinds of cancers. Now we have the most complex organ, our brain and the intersection, okay. right, between our brain and our environment and all the things that play into that. And, and I think we're ready to tackle this, but I think sometimes because it's a new discussion, people are beginning to be confused about what about sadness? Does that mean I'm ill because right. I'm sad, because I had a death in the family or some mm. kind of loss? Is anxiety all bad? Isn't some of it good in that it spurs me on to do what I need to yes. do? So I think that over time, as we talk more, we will also sort that out. You know, it's the difference between wellness, prevention and wellness, and then treatment for what is a disorder and how do I know I have a disorder? And then all the questions about where do I get help? How do I get help, et cetera? But I think we're just sorting out now. And I think yeah. Arthur talks about population health. You know, yes. really talking about all the things we can do to create a better environment. So we really tap into our potential. You know, we raise kids who are resilient. We're right. able to do the very best we can do. And, and that's an exciting frontier. Well, I love what you're saying around just a little riff off of that just for a moment. This idea that what if our emotions, even when they're difficult, can actually be at a primary prevention level, something that we can harness isn't it wonderful that I get to be sad over the death of a loved one? What are you talking about? Well, that, well, if I can lean into that, I get to appreciate. If I'm sad, that must have meant that we had such a wonderful relationship. Right. And I get to hold in a legacy kind of a way yeah. the, the beauty of that legacy, what we had together, and I get to reinvest that energy in those that I'm still around that are available to me right now and harness it in a good way. Or my, my anxiety, like you said, what if I harness that yeah. kind of that Yerkes Dodson bell-shaped curve? If I can harness that in that zone area, and really channel that, I can be my best self. So, you know, it's because we have feelings doesn't mean they're all bad. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. I, I think that's important. And I think, you know, that's something also adolescents struggle with because it's a very difficult time in your life being an adolescent. I yes. myself had a very chaotic adolescence. And I think knowing how to handle the the kind of things you come up against 
and knowing when you really are going to need more support than you're currently getting. It, yes. It's tough. And we're still kind of figuring all that out, I think. I want to talk a little bit about some of the challenges in just a minute, but as you're yeah. talking about this and as, as mental health has a chance to be named and discussed and programs put together for these things to enhance our lives, you're also talking about there's there's a growth of funds for services happening now. Oh. Investors coming in, mental health as a place to invest is really just booming, isn't it? It is booming. And, and you know, if you look since the pandemic and you look at, you know, President Biden and the bills and legislation that he and Congress have passed, every one of them, the gun bill, in fact, is not really a gun bill. They don't do much really about guns, but they invest a tremendous amount in mental health which is for some people a safer conversation than gun control. But we're not here to talk about that. But I think government has had an outpouring of money to the states and the states are trying to do all kinds of creative things with that funding. The infrastructure bill, the recovery act, the gun bill, all of those contain lots of money for mental health. And I think when parity passed, I think what we didn't, I certainly didn't expect, you know, I've always worked in the public and not-for-profit world. I didn't know that there were all these very wealthy investors sitting on mm -hmm. the sidelines, always looking for a place to put their money. And yeah. so venture and private equity became real players starting in 2008. And right before the pandemic, actually among healthcare for private investors, behavioral health was the where they were putting their money and it's yes. coming back now again. So I think we have that. The other thing is at the end of October, I'm going to be out in Napa with foundations and high net worth individuals who are turning their attention to mental health and are mm. thinking about what should they invest in? You know, what can they spark with philanthropy? So you've got the philanthropic sector, you have yes. government and you have the private investor all in the field for good and for bad. Yes. There are, you know, some questions about private investment and that, you know, their time limit and it getting sold. But in fact, I think they also raise the floor for the not-for-profit and government sector. But we can talk about that later. Linda, as you talk about these growth of funds, help our listeners understand the importance of the parity. Yeah. So, you know, parity and then the Affordable Care Act, because they really, in some ways, in my mind, go together. You know, parity told insurance companies, Congress said, you know, when the president signed it, that you have to treat mental illnesses and addictions the way you treat any physical disorder. And yes. then the Affordable Care Act made it an essential benefit in health plans. So it was, you know, kind of two things. I think parity certainly has been helpful. I think for practitioners, it has sometimes been a disappointment. And we are still in a struggle about what does that mean, treating it equally? And there have been, you know, several court cases, one very big case out in California against United Healthcare, Healthcare. that was then overturned, now has been modified. It's really a back and forth. And I think the other thing that is fundamental issue that I've come to really think about in the last year or so is much of physical health. When you talk about things like pediatric visits, family visits, internists, they don't get paid all that well. The yeah. real money in healthcare is procedures, right? That's Everything right. from colonoscopies to cardiac yeah. surgery. Well, we don't have that many procedures in mental health. And we also have a very long visit model. Mm -hmm. So physical health, it's a 10-minute visit. That's how they bill. That's how you know they line up their patients. Well, what does parity mean then for us? Because if you look at all the cash, right, mm -hmm. a lot of practitioners only take cash, both because insurance doesn't pay as well, and it's also onerous when you take insurance. Yes. Most physicians on the physical side have huge back offices for billing all the various insurance companies. So I think we have to be realistic about what parity is achieving and what it won't do. It won't be competitive with the $400 visit that psychiatrists in New York are charging. 
We'll be right back after word from our sponsor. Continuing education is both a requirement and a learning opportunity, but finding the right CE provider can be challenging. AATBS, a triad company, offers continuing education for psychologists, social workers, marriage and family therapists, counselors, and behavior analysts. CE courses are available both individually and as part of our new All Access Pass. All Access Pass provides a library of over 250 unique courses. That's more than 800 hours of CEs, with new courses being added every month. As a special offer, Behavioral Health Today listeners can save 15% on CE purchases. Visit us at aatbs.com bht and enter promo code bht15 during checkout. That's aatbs.com bht. Check out our library and check off your CE requirements today. Right, right. Yeah, I'm curious as to when we talk about the parody piece and the procedural piece, if there's opportunities, and not to go into right now, but just maybe just to name something out loud, is this opportunity for parody to come into play or regarding the procedural piece of it at the primary and secondary prevention levels? So if there are ways that that can be kind of thought of as, because <laughs> we're, we are, we're always dealing with the top, aren't we? The tertiary piece yes. that now that yes. you're sick, now we're in a reactive mode versus a preventative or early intervention yeah. mode after something's been detected. So could there be a procedural piece in that? Let me just seed that idea and we'll come we'll come back to it at some point so, in our so lives together. It, yeah. It's very interesting. And I, and yeah. I think about that a lot. And yeah. a lot of my former colleagues, you know, um, are now in positions in various insurance companies, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can always have a good meeting with an insurance company, <laughs> with a managed care company. They're great to meet with, but they do what they're paid for. That's and right. they are primarily paid to cover you when you're sick, not to ensure that you don't get sick. So that's one problem. The other problem is there is churn in insurance. So who insures me today may not be who insures me tomorrow. So the long view of if we invest in prevention, we won't have to pay in the end is not really their problem and actuarially doesn't work out for them so well. Because in the end, where they spend most money is end of life, which That's is right. very expensive. And there's a whole other conversation about how we handle that. So I think the expectation that insurance companies are going to get heavily into prevention, I don't see that on the near horizon. I think it's always going to have to be something that's supported by government, by philanthropy, even by investors who will come up as I just had a, a discussion with an adventure, a private equity fund that's looking at, you know, doing something in the private sector on raising resilient children. So I think there are places that will pay attention to that. I don't think insurance companies are going to pay for that other than, you know, like they pay for mammographies for if we had a right. test that we could take, they would cover that. And maybe what you're talking about, they do what they do best. And we may not require them to have to change to meet the creative opportunities that you're receiving here, or you're conveying here that people could be receiving at the primary and secondary. And maybe, right. you know, like you're saying, we don't have a health care model. We have a sick care model. Yeah. And so if we were to look at procedural things at the primary and secondary, maybe even what you're talking about with the philanthropists and other investors being right. able to do that piece while the insurance companies get the, you know, the tertiary piece, yes. we've got a full model right there. Yes. It also has financial backing and yep. it enhances the overall well-being, health and mental health yes. of our folks you, out you there. Know, one of the things we talk about in our country is how much we spend on health care. And part of it is because we don't have a system, right? We have so many players all doing very well financially, so we don't have a lot of incentive to change it. But we also don't have a social safety net that's very strong. And so we're beginning to think that in healthcare, we're going to cover the things that in other countries, social services cover. Mm -hmm. And that's a conundrum for us, right? Because we know there's a correlation between poverty and mental illness. Yes. We know that if you don't have stable housing, you're not going to do well in the rest of your life. Well, right. is that a healthcare problem? Or is that a political determinant of health? I don't call them social. I call them political determinants mm -hmm. of health because it's up to us as a nation. Are we going to pay for those things that will make it possible for people to live their very best lives? Yeah. You know, you're talking about the good news 
that we are able to talk about and normalize conversations around mental health now in ways that we've never been able to before in the same way that we look at other aspects of our health and also ways that we're looking to creatively fund services, not just by the government, but investors and philanthropists, like you're saying. But mental health still has some challenges to it, including maybe even how to talk about some things and maybe confusion about what emotions are versus, you know, illnesses and how to get care. Talk about some of the challenges you've seen. Yeah. So I see them all the time. I get calls all the time about people who are seeking help for yeah. themselves or a family member and can't get it. They make calls. And even when they're willing to pay, you know, out of pocket, they're not taking new patients or they call, you know, their insurance company who gives them a list of all the providers mm. in the network. And some of them don't even answer the phone or others don't call back. we we'll call back. Very, very. I think now stigma is not our problem. Our problem is access and yes. how people can pay for it. And I think the people who may suffer the most, really the most, are working class people. Yes. People who can't pay out of pocket and then right. get at least a little reimbursement. Right. And remember, we created, when we created deinstitutionalization way yeah. back in the 60s and 70s, you know, this network of community mental health centers, but they're mostly narrowly focused on people with the most serious mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. So people with anxiety and depression that are really interfering with their ability to work and take care of their families they really are having an awful time finding yeah. where to go and how to get help. You have such an awesome kind of 10,000, probably 30,000 foot view of these things, which is so helpful because sometimes we get kind of stuck in the weeds. But if we yes. can have folks like you going into like the Napas and talking about these things as well as the government, you know, opportunities that are that are possible here, what are some ways that you see that we could be improving the effectiveness of our care. I think that there are a few few things. One is it, my pet peeve is let's stop talking about mental health system. It doesn't yes. exist. We don't have a healthcare system, right? We don't have a NICE the way Great Britain does, but we do have communities, and it may be at that community yeah. and neighborhood level that we need to look at what do we have and what's missing. The other thing is because there is a lot of money and a lot of interest in mental health. We have a lot of duplication also, mm -hmm. and I know the not-for-profit kind of behavioral health landscape quite well, and you know there are really times where people should consider mergers, that you need to be big enough, you need to have economy of scale, but if you are mission-driven and your founders, your board is mission-driven, and you know it's different in business when there's an acquisition or a merger, all the people in leadership make money and, and yeah. a lot of money. In the not-for-profit sector, when there's a merger, people lose their jobs, boards lose their board seats. Yeah. So it's not something that gets done. So we have to have political will also. So in a neighborhood, in a community, what currently exists, what doesn't exist, and what kind of changes can we begin to make at, at a local level? It's almost like instead of starting at our grass top, starting at our grass roots, it's, you know, what, what Arthur did in Philadelphia in many ways. Exactly. But, you know, the other thing is Arthur had constancy of leadership. He was there for a long time. Many places we have great turnover, you know, at certainly the kind of government, county and state levels where you need to really be willing to be a bit fearless, not reckless, but fearless and really take on some things that don't have popularity amongst everyone. Yeah. We get to appreciate in talks like this, there are programs out there like the Certified Community Behavioral Health yeah. Clinics, the CCBHCs, and they are a, a tremendous time. We've, we've talked to a couple of folks that are, are, are doing those, one in Missouri and yeah, uh, yeah, just, no, they're they're going to be in every state. Yeah, so what phenomenal. happened was name those we were able us. Yeah. we were able to pass a demonstration project uh, when I was at the National Council. Our champions, Debbie Stabenow, the senator from yeah. Michigan, and Roy Blunt, the Republican senator from Missouri, really were yeah. our champions in the Senate. 
to begin to say, you know, for those in your audience who know federally qualified health centers that really are very holistic, right, and have gotten a lot of attention and a lot of support in underserved communities, why don't we have something equivalent to that on the behavioral health side? And that was really, it was really, you know, taking a step. The other thing was federally qualified health centers get something called prospective payment. So they get paid based on their costs. We wanted that for behavioral health as a way to raise the clinical floor, to be honest, because there's a lot better work behavioral health organizations in the community who try so hard often can't pay salaries to really have skilled staff. It's a right. whole other discussion. And so yeah. CCBHCs became a way to do that. We had a demonstration project, and now it's been added to. More states are going to have the prospective payment model. During the previous administration, during the Trump administration, they wouldn't do anything that expanded or touched Medicaid. So they did several grant programs, which still exist, and will continue to exist, but now it's going to become a prospective payment program over the next 10 years, I believe, in almost every state. So it's something certainly I'm very proud of, of having been a part of beginnings. And of course, Dr. Mongolia is doing a fabulous job. He was my head of policy, you know, as the CEO. These behavioral health clinics, just for our listeners, these are specifically designated clinics that provide comprehensive range of mental health services and substance use services. And they service anyone that walks through their door, regardless of the diagnosis yeah. and insurance status. They're they're phenomenal. Actually, we did a show on that if you want to go back and listen to it, one Great. of our podcasts. It was Great. so good, Linda, and uh, so innovative. And, and the fact that they're getting funding for that and payment for it, that's one of the innovative you know suggestions yeah. that, are, that are out there to expand this capacity for care. Anything else you might Kind of throw the out for us. The other thing I've become familiar with recently, because, you know, like I say, it's good to be passionately curious, are yes. something called employee owned businesses. Mm-hmm. And they do exist in mental health and addictions. And it's something to be thinking about. You know, we have a tremendous problem, not only of recruitment of clinical staff, but retention. And one of the ways you retain people, one of the ways companies retain people is they get stock in a company, right? Here you get stock in Mm -hmm. this employee-owned behavioral health organization. So that's something else I think we need to learn more about and explore. It is not something we talk about a lot, Mm -hmm. but I think it's worth taking a look at. I think the other thing I've seen is I have seen not-for-profits, and I'm thinking of one particularly in Pennsylvania, that began to do telepsychiatry 15, 20 years ago because one of their psychiatrists moved to Ohio and she continued to treat patients for them. Mm -hmm. They then spun that off into a for-profit business which benefits the not-for-profit. So I think that's the other thing is to look, if you're an organization, is there something you can do on the for-profit side particularly that depends upon technology because investors are very interested and as we all should be in technology, but it also creates a margin, you know, person to person services. There's only so many people you can see and there's only so much margin you can get. That's right. Whereas Mm -hmm. technology is a way that you really can have bigger margins. And if you're a for-profit Uh, A not-for-profit that then forms a for-profit, it can benefit your not-for-profit as well. So I would encourage people to look at that, at what they're doing, and is there something there that could be the seed of a for-profit business? I think think the other thing is just, you know, an investment in technology. Mm -hmm. I think AI, I don't know if you use it at all, Graham. It is fabulous. I actually had to write an introduction for someone who was getting (laughs) an award, and I typed in the name, and in one second, I had an introduction. I went back and said, I want to start with a quote. One second later, I had a new version with a quote. I then said, pay more attention to what he's done recently than what he did years ago. Uh One second later, I had that. I then, of course, edited and molded it, you know, to be in my voice, but I have used it several times in different ways. And I think it really can make 
will make a tremendous difference. You know, the whole issue of keeping notes and who takes them and how do they, you know, get into the chart and organizations are always chasing their clinicians to make sure their notes are timely because bills are based upon notes. I think diagnosis, I think treatment planning, all of that will undergo just like telehealth affected behavioral health more than any other part of healthcare. I think AI has the potential to do the same. You see it in the direct delivery of services coming into play? I think as an adjunct, I think it will always be, I like to use, and it may be old fashioned, kind of the expression, high touch, high tech. Yes. So I think it can be something that you can use in between sessions that reminds you to do certain things. And we're actually looking at a company. I'm an advisor to an investment fund and we're looking at a company that has that very thing. They have an adjunct person who becomes your support in between sessions. Got it. You know, as we talk about the provision of services and some of the challenges and some of the really hopeful things that you're putting out here and ways that we can fund these, and we're, we're only limited by our that creativity. Will be covered by insurance, by the way. Having an adjunct, when we look at alternate payment models, and I think we're going to be looking more and more at bundled and capitations and subcaps, you have the room to pay for other treatment supports. Yes. Well, as we talk about all these things, I also know at the same time, you're at Columbia in the Department of Psychiatry, right? and you're working with and training our upcoming colleagues. And this one, this has to be fun. It's got to be just a, a, a wonderful fun, position. Although, to be perfectly frank, big healthcare systems like, you know, Columbia, New York Presbyterian, yeah. whether it's NYU or Cedar sinai out in California, they move slowly and mm -hmm. for good reasons, right? Mm -hmm. I like to move fast and I'm a problem solver, right? And one of the great things before I retired from the National Council and even up a, you know, in Albany at the state authority is we could have an idea and make it happen. Mm -hmm. In academia, things happen more slowly and more people weigh in before something actually right. takes hold. I think the other thing we need to do is we, most mental health care is delivered by social workers. And soon to be, I think, marriage and family therapists, you know, and, and mental health counselors. We need to look at that curriculum because I don't think we're graduating people who practice according to the newest and best research. I don't think evidence-based practices nor a short-term therapy taught in those programs. And I think that is an area where we can really increase effectiveness. When you frame those two pieces that you'd like to see happen more and more, what what do you notice about those coming into mental health at this time? Kind of the incoming classes. They, they, you know, as I always say, you know, nobody has trouble recruiting hedge fund men and women, but it's harder, you know, to to recruit people for areas that don't pay as well. But I think what I do see is, you know, people who are passionate about it who really? care about social justice tremendously. And that's why I feel we owe them something, yeah. not so much psychologists and psychiatrists, which get more rigorous training, yeah. but social workers are who are doing most of the direct work. Yeah. And I think we need to look at those curriculums. I, I feel passionately about that. The thing I'm involved with at Columbia is something called Engage, where we're creating a lay workforce from the local communities, where for many of them will become a path to go on to social work or nursing or psychiatry or psychology. And what, what they're doing at Columbia, my colleagues there who began doing this actually in Mozambique, it's a project we're calling Engage. What they're doing is they're, you know, we have two pilot sites in New York City and more to come. And I think that from the beginning, people are being trained in evidence-based interventions, being trained in short-term treatment, and supervised for a year. And I think that's what we don't do enough of. I can see that really having some great application when it comes to the primary and secondary prevention yep. places of entry. 
you know, yeah. maybe leaving some of the tertiary piece up here. And, for those and are... in primary care itself. I mean, Absolutely. we now have yes. code, collaborative care codes where yeah. primary care can bill for, you know, adjunct consultation around mental mm -hmm. illness and addiction screening mm -hmm. and brief treatment. So there's a lot of possibilities around that. Linda, what's your message for those entering the field? And are curious, and and what's your primary uh, message that you curious. hope set a cornerstone? I mean, it, think of yourself. I I think as a lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. I think the good news is you have so many opportunities. Everybody's yeah. vying for you. They really yeah. are, right? The online treatment companies that are privately owned. You know, the the not for profits that have gotten an increase in rates, and their biggest problem is staffing, recruitment, and retention. So I think you're going to have a lot of opportunities. You know, first of all, you know, be your best self, obviously, be an avid learner and be an advocate. That's the other thing is you really can make change at the city, state and national level. You have to understand how government works and not just get disgusted by it, but actually have an agenda that you want to be part of moving. Really good. You know, you've You've been there, done that in so many areas, and congratulations on what you've achieved uh, in your life. Too. What's the most enjoyable part of your, your professional life in this season of your life? The most, uh, it really, one is helping as many individuals as, as I can who call me, who are either entering the field and want to learn more and be connected to opportunities, families that are desperate to get help, you know, that on a personal level, you know, because i got to know and work with so many people across the country that someone from New York can call me about a family member in Texas, and I often have a resource. So, so that's exciting. It's exciting to, to really be part of an academic medical center. It's exciting to work in the private sector and to, you know, do what I can really to help, again, raise the clinical floor and at the same time make operations of organizations more efficient so that treatment can be more effective. Really good. Well, Linda, as we wind down today, you talked about some resources. I would love our listeners to follow up with you. We have the CCBHCs. We have your work at Columbia. And just to be able to contact you directly. Sure. Let us know how to connect with those things, would you please? Sure. Yes. So people should, for the CCBHC, they should go to the National Council website, www.thenationalcouncil.org. When you go to the website, you'll see a CCBHC Success Center, and it will tell you where they are, where they're coming, and all the details. So I encourage people to do that. Nice. And you also at Columbia, give us a sense of maybe how folks can learn more about that aspect yeah. of your life. So I hope people will contact me, particularly around Engage, the program where we're creating a new workforce starting in New York, but we're looking at pilots, you know, in other places. Okay. And they can contact me at LR2992 at cumc.columbia.edu. Fantastic. Linda, thank you so much. Well, Linda, this has been a joy to be with you on the phone today. Oh. Thanks for all you're doing. It's a fun interview and it's so much fun to kind of get an, a, a larger perspective on all the things that are happening and are possible. I wish you well in your conversations in Napa. And it's great to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for being with us. It was us. great to meet you. And I enjoy listening to you and all the shows that you do. You're Bye. very kind. Thanks for that. Also want to thank you, our listeners, for dropping by and joining Linda and me today. It's always great to have you with us. Regarding our episode today, I want to remind you that it and an archive of all of our other episodes and resource materials can be found on our webpage at triadhq.com slash BHT. Thanks again for being with us on the show, and we'll look forward to having you back with us next time on Behavior Health Today. We appreciate all the support from our community, and if you like our show, one of the best ways you can support it is by giving us a five-star rating and leaving a review. Behavioral Health Today is a podcast part of the Tribe Network, all rights reserved.